بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعما نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So respected uh, elders, respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Unfortunately, I wasn't here for the earlier talk, but I'm assuming uh, the, the, the talk was about marriage. Um, can you confirm that? It was about modesty, I guess it links to marriage. I was given the topic of divorce, so I don't know where that comes into it. If you haven't spoken about marriage, I don't know where divorce comes into it. Okay. So I don't know what that is. Maybe that's just the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to speak about it. It's actually quite important, even if you're not married, it's actually very important for us to understand the concept of divorce in Islam. Because what I've seen in, in uh, my life as an Imam, as such, dealing with a lot of community problems and issues, social issues, I've seen that a lot of the time the problem that comes up in a marriage where divorces are given, they're uttered, uh, they're articulated by the tongue, the re a lot of it is, is it's, it's spontaneous, it's not, th it's not premeditated, it's not uh, well thought out, it's out of anger, it's, uh, it's by mistake, it's said accidentally, in fact it's said as a joke sometimes, and the thing is that the divorce is such a thing that you just can't mess with it, it's like it's worse than playing with fire. That's why I think it is a very important topic even if you're not married. Because it's a good idea to prepare ourselves to understand what divorce is all about, how this institution works in Islam, so that when you do get married, if you're not married, and for those who are married, then they can prepare, uh, prepare themselves or at least protect themselves. So firstly, let's, let's understand what uh, divorce is all about. I mean, dictionaries make it seem like a very simple affair. So you've got, uh, for example, you've got... Uh, the Webster's Dictionary. The Webster's Dictionary defines divorce as the legal dissolution of marriage or the termination of an existing relationship or union. It's kind of very simple, isn't it? The dissolution of a union, right? The separation of, uh, of two people. It's, it's, it makes it seem very simple. All the emotional factors, the social implications, none of that is taken into consideration here. But that's a dictionary definition. You know, it's not an encyclopedic entry. It's a, it's a dictionary, that's what's saying. I mean, if you look at it, uh, a, a better translation would be, especially if there's children involved, especially if there are children involved in a marriage, as, 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 as is the case in many, in many situations, then another defini uh, definition of uh, uh, divorce would be, divorce is like a thousand knives being thrown in at one's heart. A thousand knives being thrown at one's heart or a slow, painful ride through Horror Mountain. It's probably a, a theme ride. I'm not sure if it's in America or it's in England, I'm not sure. Right? But uh, apparently this is to understand it from a child's perspective. Because when a child is involved, it, it, it's just the, the, the issue is just compounded many fold. You know, two people who are married but don't have children could get away with a clean divorce, a decent divorce where there's not many psychological ramifications. But when there's children involved, even if they're infants, you know, even if it's an infant that's involved, then there's just the, the ramifications, the implications, the negative consequences, in fact the dangers and the harms of that are compounded manifold. And that's what we need to understand. And then that's where we look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who so beautifully put it. Because if you look at the Bible, if you look at the Old Testament, New Testament, it though it permits it, uh, the, the permission for divorce, you know, as it currently stands, is is very limited. It only allows it in the case of what they call infidelity. I mean, for us, infidelity normally means taking on a different deen, you know, going against Islam as such. But uh, for some reason, the word infidelity is actually used for adultery. It's what used for extramarital relationship and affairs, right? But basically, that's the way it's normally translated for, for them. So, it mentions that aside from one or two very specific cases, 
divorce should not take place. It should be honored until the last moments. And the, and the verbiage that's used is, is basically uh, based on that. Well, nowadays, I mean, divorces primarily become more of a secular kind of institution, you know, outside. Uh, just as marriages, you know, you can do a drive-by marriage as, as they do in... Uh, I remember I was in a, in a bookshop. Uh, I was in a bookshop in uh, the West End. It's a Muslim bookshop, and uh, I was going to speak about some books. I went downstairs, and mashallah, there's an office there, right? There's an office, and the owner of the bookshop, he's a sheikh, probably a graduate of Azhar, I think, of Jamiat al Azhar in, in, uh, from Cairo. And uh, as I walked down, there's a ceremony taking place in the, you know, in the basement of that bookshop. And there's a, uh, th there's a couple, and he's basically making them say these long uh, words, uh, you know, to solemnize the marriage. After that, uh, one of the... The, the brother of the bride, he, he came up to me because uh, he, he studies at the same place I study and he shook my hands and I said like, what's going on here? Where's the marriage in the masjid? Right? Is this, uh, he says, look, you know, I, I, I have no idea about this. Right? I think I, I kind of got an understanding of what was going on from just the way he responded to that. So then I said to him, is it one of these Las Vegas jobs? Right. That was a joke. Of course, it's a joke. There's a big difference between a Las Vegas drive-through marriage, as they do there, right? Uh, if you don't understand Las Vegas marriages, I apologize. Um, but basically, it's, it's a drive-through place where there's, uh, the laws don't apply as much, and there's a, it's, a, it's a very simple affair, right? You want to get married overnight, you go and do it there, and then uh, I'm not sure of the rest of the consequences there. Of course, here, it's a, it's a, it's a sheikh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a Muslim marriage that's taking place obviously there's the kalam of Allah being recited there's uh, there, there is uh, both sides promising uh, doing the ijab and kubul the the offer and acceptance it's a whole different thing but if you understand what I'm saying that taking it out of the masjid where the barakah is into a place here where you pay to get a marriage done it's a whole different thing but basically you do understand from that perspective that marriage marriage is actually it's it's so important the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a very very comprehensive statement this despite being short he kind of encompassed everything he said abghadul halali ilallahi at-talaq abghadul halali ilallahi at-talaq which basically means that the worst uh, the, the the most detested the most hated the most loathed permissible act the most loathed lawful act is divorce so he it's as though begrudgingly he's saying it is lawful but it is the most detested act. And the reason for it is not just the social one, it's a very personal, it's a very psychological one. Number of studies have been done, not just on the children involved in a, in a divorce case, but also in the people who are involved, in, in the couple that are involved in this divorce. Even 10 years afterwards, especially when they're to make another major decision, sometimes the ramifications of that come about there, there as well, it affects the next marriage as well. Other than that, a number of studies have shown how d children of divorced parents are likely do have a greater possibility, a greater potential to do the same thing that their parents did. I, I, I personally, I think the way to look at it is that what a divorce does in a family is that it weakens everybody's resolve. It doesn't give you a good role model to follow. So when the children are undergoing a divorce, the, the, the kind of uh, negative harms, the, the harms that the, child's, uh, the, the child normally experiences in this uh, feeling of confusion, that sometimes they're just too young to even understand what's going on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the nature of the human race, in fact, not just, well, primarily the human race, where a couple get together. They could be two complete, um, they could be two completely different people in the sense of not related, never having met before. They come together, they could be from different cultures, different countries, different backgrounds, different languages, right? Different uh, food preferences, uh, ethnicity, whatever you want to say. They come together 
in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about the barakah, the blessing that envelops them after the marriage is solemnized, after the ijab and qubul is done, after the nikah takes place, right? Then what happens is you have a very special relationship form that continues. If it lasts this world, it continues into the hereafter. And you know the most amazing thing is that who is a person going to be with in paradise? A person is going to be with their spouse. So a wife is going to be with a husband, a husband is going to be with the wife. You're not going to be with your mother or father. You're not going to be with your son or daughter, right? Or any other relative for that matter. You're going to be with your spouse. I mean, that is amazing. So pick the right spouse in this world. You know, I guess I'm getting into the marriage. I'm trying to cover the marriage aspect here, right? Pick the right spouse because it continues. Now, some of you may question that um, what happens if a woman, for instance, right? A woman, for instance, had one husband who passed away or was divorced and then she had another husband. Of course, if it was divorced, then no longer, they're no longer married anyway. So you can understand that she'll probably be with the next husband in paradise if that lasts. But what happens if a woman, this was asked to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that what happens if a woman who is, uh, who, whose husband passes away, dies, and then she gets married to somebody else? Which of the husbands will she be with? Because that hadith kind of gives an understanding that a woman will only be with one man, right? So, one of the responses, uh, one, one narration mentions the best of them in character. The best of them in character. She'll be given a choice to get the best one in character to live. Now, of course, we leave that, all that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because paradise is a place that will give so much bliss and eternal happiness that it will, there you will have what no eye has seen and that has not, no, no ear has heard the description thereof and neither has the thought or the, the concept of it. It's beyond whatever could occur in your heart. So we leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just to kind of give an understanding of this very special relationship and the impact that it has. Now, we don't have much time. So and, and this topic is not about just the, the, just the harms of, of a divorce. I'd like to provide some guidance, just based on my experience of speaking to various different couples, divorcees, people who are divorced, people who are wanting to divorce, people who've made mistakes. And that's what I want to mention. Number, th uh, number one, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing is that the Prophet ﷺ said that the worst of the lawful things is divorce. Now, those of you who are not married and think, well, divorce is too far off, I'm not even married yet, right? Just understand it as a lesson. Just internalize it. Just, just try to carry it with you so that you're protected even from before you marry. That's why a lot of the ulama nowadays are actually recommending, recommending that pe before they marry, pe pe uh, before young people marry, before anybody marries for that matter, they should actually have marriage classes. You know, just like we hold these uh, intensive workshops on, on uh, you know, salat and uh, fasting and uh, uh, what do you call it, zakat workshops and others. I think there should be marriage workshops and a very good time for that is probably around May, June, just before marriage season begins, <laughs> right? So I think, I think we're in our masjid, we're going to try to hold some of those this year because I think it's really important. A quick class on, on marriage and the fiqh of divorce. Right now, you might think, why do you want to mention divorce? Well, it's there. It's a reality, and that's what it is. It's uh, it's in the subconscious, and it's it's a sad fact. You know, a person uh, a person is considered to be rectified inside within himself as long as they can they have good character. The faculties inside, if they're in moderation, if they are if they are perfectly tuned, they will then exude good character. Right? If the person doesn't get angry too much or doesn't have too less of an anger to become a coward, for instance, the person doesn't have too much shahwa to go and do things haram or doesn't have too less desire and shahwa that doesn't even fulfill the rights of his spouse or if it's a woman, her spouse, for instance. So when these faculties are in moderation, they will manifest a good character in, in, in the person. In, in the body of the person, in the attitude of the person. Now what happens? You know, some of us never swear. In a normal conversation, some of us never swear. Some people just can't help it. 
they, in every sentence, they need to have a swear word, otherwise they just don't, don't get the high, right? And you'll see that, and you just wonder, why do you have to swear, right? But it's just, I think if you've gone through it, you understand it's just this feeling of uh, power. If you don't swear enough, you don't give the big one, then it just doesn't <laughs> give the impact that you need. And it, it's a sad case. Now, now, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about a person who's... Uh, rhetoric is swearing I'm talking about a person who doesn't normally swear but when somebody cuts them off at the light right or somebody cuts them off when driving for instance you will stick two fingers up right or you will swear or you'll curse now you're supposed to be a decent person you know people consider you to be decent but then this comes out in a state of anger. Why does it come out? And that's what we need to think about today because this is very similar to how people divorce. And I have to speak to men right now because it's the men who have this divorce problem, right? Women have a different problem in terms of requesting or demanding divorce, right? So there is a different problem, but demanding a divorce personally on the face of it doesn't seem as extreme and it's not it's not extreme it doesn't have the same kind of implications as a man giving the divorce does because there it's a request it's up to the man to oblige or not or refuse but when the man does it it's done the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says thalathun hazluhun najiddun wa uh, which basically means that there are three things in Islam, three institutions in Islam, where if you say them seriously, if you mean what you say, if you say them consciously, in a premeditated fashion, they will occur. And even if you say them without premeditating, you say them as a jest, as a joke, even then they will be taken seriously because they there are things not to mess with. An nikah, wa talaq, wal itaq, and there's another version which says um, that there's a difference of opinion about the third one. But the, the two things that, that uh, or actually the one thing that relates to us today, uh, the first one is nikah. If two people get married, right? If two people marry each other, actually, let me, let me not get to this because someone might try it. Because it actually has, uh, people do try this, especially nowadays. If, if a couple get together, um, um, a man and a woman, and there's two witnesses, and they say that I would like to marry you, or I marry you, and the other person says I accept, it's a nikah. It's a, it's a makru, it's, it's, it's completely undesirable, it's detested, reprehensible, etc., etc., but it's a nikah. Right? Now, the second one is talaq. If a person says it as a joke to his wife that I divorce you, I'm only joking, it's done. It, it, it's done. You just can't use that. It's not something. In fact, you know, you'd be surprised. There's a couple that called me. The husband and wife were learning Arabic. You know, maybe an Indian Pakistani couple, right? In America. They're learning Arabic. So, you know what the guy is practicing on his wife? Anti Talik. Anti Talik. You are divorced. I mean, can't you find something else? Anti Habiba, you know? Like your beloved or something. And the guy's like, Anti Talik. I mean, tell me, what is that? Isn't that shaitan trying to dissolve a family? Right? So, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that it's a very serious issue. And I'm giving you these examples so you can understand that it's just not something you can play with. It's not something that should be there. Going back to the whole thing about the psychology of swearing, even for people who seem <coughs> decent. It's the underlying factor. It's when you get angry. It's when something just suddenly comes up to you that you can't control yourself. And that's, if we're like that, we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah give us control over ourselves. Allahumma, one dua, and everybody should read it right now so that at least you've read it once. And if you can memorize it, alhamdulillah, you can read it later. Allahumma, la takilni ila nafsi tarfata ain. Oh Allah, don't submit myself to myself to my nafs even for the blink of an eye but oh Allah you be in control yeah, that's the implication of it that don't let me don't let me become subjugated to my nafs so that basically it makes me do what's wrong in association with the with the shaitan some cultures alhamdulillah in some cultures divorce is not a it's not something you talk about every day 
right? But there are some cultures, I mean, each culture has its own good things and it also has, you know, its, its bad things. And certain cultures, divorce is like something that's, talked, that's spoken about every day. A person is, a friend of mine told me this, his, he's being invited somewhere to eat. And he's saying, no, no, I, I, I've eaten, I can't come. He said, the person insisted, the host insisted, the person who was visiting, the, the man of the house was insisting that he eat with them. And he's like, no, I don't want to eat, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm full, I'm done. He said, if you don't eat, my wife is divorced. <laughs> now, what has his wife done wrong? <laughs> and seriously, she hasn't done anything wrong. She hasn't done anything wrong. This is just the culture. This is just their normal statement. And you know, there are cases where, and obviously in that case, because you're a part of that society, you'll say, okay, I'll eat something just to make sure you don't break his oath, right? It's ridiculous. It's not something to bring on because just so let's say you find some stubborn guy like, I don't care. I don't care if your wife gets divorced. It's your problem. And then he walks out. You're going to chase him for the rest of your life if you're, if you're going to be concerned about that. It's ridiculous. It's abuse of women, right? It's a, it's a subconscious abuse of women. They don't even realize what they're doing. Can you imagine the wife, what she's feeling, right? It's ridiculous. It's just something, alhamdulillah, it's not in all cultures. In the time of uh, earlier on, in the time of one of the great scholars, I, uh, some people relate this from Imam Abu Hanif and Allah knows best. But what it is is that somebody said to his wife, now I don't know where he thought this one up from. It's like people sit and think, you know, what should I say? How should I phrase this? So he said to his wife that um, you are divorced. Something must have happened. He said, you are divorced if I cannot perform any, partic uh, any, uh, any worship that nobody else is doing at that time in the entire world. <laughs> Unless I can find a worship to do and do it, that nobody else at the same time is doing, then you are divorced. Now, where did you think that one up from? <laughs> right? Have you lost everything else? Did you just uh, exhaust everything else? I mean, come on, man, what's the problem? So, then he regrets it. Because it, th these things, I don't know, they're just part of the culture or something. I don't know, they, it's just real ignorance, right? Then he regrets it. Now he starts to go and look for a fatwa, right? He goes to the different ulama and everybody's saying, you know what, there's nothing. Your salat, if you're, if you're saying it's prayer, there's thousands of people praying at the same time, right? If it's adhan, there's an adhan going on somewhere in the world somewhere, right? If it's uh, reading the Quran, if it's fasting, somebody's doing it. Eventually, say he came to this great scholar, whether it was Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, or somebody else, I'm not sure. And... He said, okay, fine, I have something. You could have charged him a lot of money for this, right? <laughs> Nowadays, this is what people would do, expert. I'll, I'll find you the loophole, you know, tax expert. But um, he said, go to the haram, right? Go to the haram, Mecca, right? Masjid al-Haram, and find a time when nobody's around there, right? And make a tawaf. Because tawaf, that going around the Kaaba, that's the only thing that can only be done there in that place and you know if somebody is doing it on jinnah excluded I guess in this case right don't try this today though right thinking well I've got a way out because that's virtually impossible unless you can become buddies with the king or something and he sorts you out that time obviously there were less people around so they could do that he escaped but just from this you can understand that this is a cultural thing that has been coming down where you abuse the word of divorce and it should not happen right now of course at the same time, there are so many stories that have come to my notice. It's where the wife is constantly, anything small happens, give me a divorce. Right? That, all that is, she doesn't want a divorce. All it is, is just a statement to pressure the husband. Right? And I tell you something, that from studies, divorce is a topic that if a couple want to... If a couple want to be together, or let's just say one person wants to have a successful marriage, and there's a constant request for divorce from the other side, like let's just say a man wants marriage, and there's a request for divorce from the other side, even though the wife really wants the marriage as well. Or if it's the husband who's always threatening divorce, psychologically, the impact that that will have the way it will tear at this relationship, the way it will just completely destroy any good feeling, 
is, is just immense. It, it, it is a word, it's that magic word basically, it's that dangerous word, it should not be said as a threat or anything. If, I'm not saying that divorce cannot happen and should never happen, no, we've been given a way out in Islam. There are cases, in fact, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ, a Sahabiya radiyallahu anha, came to the Prophet ﷺ, and she said, I have no complaints about my husband in terms of his deen, in terms of his character, in terms of what she meant was in terms of what he does for me. As, as, a, you know, as a responsible person of the home, he looks after me, well, I have no complaint in that regard, but I don't want to be hypocritical in the deen, I have no love for him, I just can't stay with him in marriage, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he understood the affair. He probably had heard about their situation or he knew the affair. Some people who might look at this hadith may, you know, just on the face of it say, well, you know, he just don't just, okay, finish it off right there and then he, he helped them to annul the marriage. No, I'm sure that there was a lot of understanding that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already had. I mean, he was, he was the, the, the father of the community. He was the prophet of the time. He was the teacher. He was everybody's intimate, uh, everybody's um, intimate, um, uh, advisor. So obviously he knew what was going on. So my assumption inshallah is that he knew what was going on and he said, okay, fine. Do you, uh, uh, c can you give back to him what he's given you uh, in terms of the, the mahar or in terms of the dowry? Like he basically said, well, you need to offer something in this regard because there's no other grounds for divorce in this case. It's, it's something that you just can't stay in the marriage and that's why you want it. Now if the husband is ready for it, so the husband agreed and then that, and then that marriage was dissolved. Right? But that's, you don't hear about that happening all the time. I came, I was, uh, I went to Philadelphia and I was being taken from the airport by one of the brothers who was also attending the conference and he was taking me back to the airport and I just got talking to him and everything and he seemed an older kind of person. I said, you married and everything. He said, I was married. But, uh, you know, we divorced on, on good terms and all the rest of it. So, I felt a bit sorry for the brother, I said, because he spoke very nicely about the person. He said that, you know, they had a good relationship, but they just couldn't hack it anymore because she had different ideas, he had different ideas, and they just weren't very compatible, right? But it felt like he still had some affection there. So, you know, just out of sympathy for the brother, I said, how many divorces did you give? He said, I gave one. Uh, I said, well, that's very, uh, I, I said, that's good, you can actually get married again. He said, you want me to give the other two? <laughs> I, said, I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, well, what's the problem here? He said, basically, his, I, he, he got the impression, I'm saying that without three divorces, it doesn't really happen, that they were still married. But basically what it is, and that's what I'm going to explain right now before I finish here, because I think this is important, the, some basic fiqh about divorce, right? Just so that if it ever has to be used, and unfortunately, Statistics are growing even in the Muslim community. You know, they're increasing. The numbers of divorce are increasing, and it's a sad fact, right? Um, a lot of people think, because there's this whole debate about three and one, three in one, and uh, one in three, the Trinity. Um, I'm talking about divorce here, right? There's this big debate out there, right? So, because of that, subconsciously, for a lot of people who are not well learned, it's as if Three divorces are the way to go. One divorce will do the job for you. But they want to give three for whatever reason. Somebody came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and gave a hundred. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you have, made, you, have, you have made a mockery. You have made a mockery by the 97. As far as the three are concerned, they're effected. But with the 97, you've made a mockery of the institution of marriage. It's a very, very delicate thing. One, one, is, one divorce is so potent that it suffices you. I mean, if there's one very potent tablet, right, that you have to take and you take three, what's going to happen? I mean, obviously it's a different thing completely, but just to give you an understanding that one divorce is more than sufficient in a bad situation. A lot of people will come to you and they'll say, I gave my wife three divorces, I was very angry, this, that and the other. And uh, I mean, so you ask them, I mean, normally marriages are given in anger and that's the problem. That's what you're supposed to control. There are three types of divorce, right? One is a straightforward divorce in plain, simple terms. You are divorced or I divorce you, right? It, it's done in the past tense or it's done in the present. You are divorced, okay? Present continue, you are divorced. What that will do is that it will, it will 
effect one divorce, the wife will move into the id, the waiting period as they call it, three menstruation cycles. But there is still a semi-connection. It's like it's a suspended marriage at this point until the three periods are over. In this time, the couple still stay together in the same house, though they're not intimate. But at this time, they're trying to reconcile. The idea is that they're trying to reconcile. Most cases, you're going to have one person not wanting it, the other person wanting it. So the person who's wanting it is going to try to do something to attract the other person. Now, if it all works out and they come together, then there's no need for a remarriage. There's no need for another nikah. They just come together and it's all fine. But the person's lost one of his divorces. He only has two more left, all right? Now, in this same instance, if a person used a more intense form of, uh, he, he used a more intense uh, form of divorce, which is, for example, he said, you are irrevocably divorced, or I give you a talaq ba'in, or I divorce you, and that is the end of it, right? Uh, that, that would be a bit open to interpretation, I think, right, in that particular term. So I take that one back. But he says, I give you an irrevocable divorce. I give you a talaq ba in, in Arabic, right? What that would do is that, again, it would still be one divorce. But in this case, different from the first case, the wife would still have to do her waiting period and still have to be looked after by the husband for the three, uh, for, for the, uh, the three cycles. But in this case, they can't just come back together without remarrying. Of course, they can come back together because only one divorce has occurred yet. They can come together, but they'll have to remarry even if it's the next day. So a marriage is necessary in this case because it's a more intense form that was articulated of the divorce. Now, number one or number two, the first one in Arabic is called talaq raj'i. Raj'i means returnable, revocable. The second one is called ba'in, which is like final, right? So it cuts it, right? There's no suspended marriage left anymore. But both of these only amount to one divorce. Now, if they get back together, in the first case, it just gets back together. Now, in the first case, just to clarify, if he finishes the three periods and they don't reconcile, then after that, they, they can still get back together, but now they'd have to marry. So in this first case, and in the talaq ba, in the second type of divorce, if they get back together, however they get back together, they have another option. So now they're married, he can again give another divorce if it comes to that, right? Obviously, getting back together must have been, uh, must have been given a lot of thought. It's, it's, uh, it's strange that they have to, you know, go through, they're, they're considering divorce again, but it can happen again. Now, let's just say it happens again. Again, the second one can be talaq raj'i or talaq ba'in, right? It'll be two divorces. Let's just say they came back together again. They reconciled, either through marriage or he just um, um, revoked. They decided to revoke and reconcile. Now, there's only one left. Meaning, if another divorce occurs, however that occurs, whether it's given straightforward, whether it's given in simple terms or complicated terms or whatever it is, as long as it amounts to a divorce, that is what you call the final point of no return, the talaq mughallad, right? That is considered the one after which, as Allah says, فَإِن طَلَّقَهَا فَلَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ مِن بَعْدُ حَتَّى تَنْكِحَ زَوْجًا غَيْرَهُ Which basically means that now, after these first two divorces, as Allah says, right, if He gives her another divorce, then she is not lawful to come back to Him, even with marriage, unless she goes and marries somebody else. A second husband, another husband, right? The first one will no longer be a husband. Another man. And then He consummates with her, he consummates the marriage with her, that's a condition. Then he divorces her, then he divorces her. Only then can, is she then free to come back to the first husband. And that did happen in the time of the Prophet ﷺ as well, where somebody divorced his wife thrice, and then she got married to uh, another person, and she didn't want to be with him, but they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. She came to the Prophet ﷺ and she started complaining about him. And basically she said that he can't perform. Her, her way of expressing it was that she took the edge of her garment and he said that he's like this, right? Kahudbati thawbi hadha. He's like, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the end of my cloth, uh, basically. But that, that they, the, the ulama mentioned that the, the man had actually children. So maybe she was exaggerating. But the Prophet told her in a very beautiful way. He said, 
uh, in a very eloquent way, he said, No. That no until you taste his honey and he tastes your honey. And the honey that he mentioned normally asal is honey, but he said usayla, which is a miniature form of saying it. So it's like until even, it, even if that consummation happens to the minimum, right? That you can ask the fuqaha that we don't have time to go into those kind of graphics right now, right? So usaylatahu wa yadhuku usaylataki only then. So what we understand from that is that that part is necessary, only then can they come back. Why do you want to get it to that? Some people, they do it all in one go, three divorces. Now I know that out there, there are fatwas out there. There is a lot of discussion out there that if you say three in one go, it only amounts to one. This is what's mentioned in the fiqh sunnah of Sayyid Sabiq. This is mentioned, this is the opinion of Imam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah and Ibn Al-Qayyim. And then there are people today who've taken those two opinions. But I would like to clarify, right? I would like to clarify that that is not the opinion of any of the four madhabs. Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, though he was a Hanbali, uh, he was a Hanbali, but this was one of his tafarrudat. This is one of his isolated opinions away from the madhab. So, though you will find these fatwas in uh, uh, quite pr uh, uh, proliferated throughout uh, the internet and other places, and you will find people who give you that fatwa, but at the end of the day, right, the majority opinion, the overwhelming majority of opinion, and the opinion of the four madhabs is that three count as three. Right? Three count as three even in the state of anger, unless the anger is so extreme that you lose yourself and after giving them you don't even know what you'd said and you have to be reminded and like convinced that you said it. Let's, let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's look at it from this perspective that somebody, this happens to and they go to somebody, they, give, they get a fatwa and they go with it. At the end of the day, you're not going to get any certification from Allah whether that is the case or not, right? In cases of ibadah, in cases where things are prohibited and they should be made permitted and they need to be made lawful, you need to go with the most cautious opinion. Otherwise, you could be in sin for a long time, right? Now, of course, for a I mean, that's not our discussion. I don't, want to, uh, in, I don't want to go beyond that in that case. But what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, a husband and wife coming together, a couple coming together for the sake of Allah, it needs to be done in a particular way. And it needs to be done in, in the most cautious way so that the offsprings that come from that are halal, are rightful. Divorce is that destroying factor. So as I said, going back to the whole swear thing that I talked about, it's not something you entertain. Don't even in your moments, if, if your spouse, right, I'm talking to brothers and sisters here, if your spouse has just for, you know, after three years of good marriage, they've started acting up for whatever reason, it could just be hormone issues. It could just be problem at work. It could be something else that's just affecting. And, the, and, and that's known. You have to try to overlook that. But what each of the couple should try to do is that you need to score as many points as possible. Right? Before anything like that happens. So from the beginning of marriage, both husband and wife need to score enough points with each other so that when a rocky time comes along, then they've got a lot of good things to think about. No, no, it's all right, man. You know, there's a lot of this other stuff. It, it's just that phase. It's just something. It's a lot easier if you're psychologically, if you're psychologically convinced that this can, you can work it through, it will happen. The day you start thinking, I don't need it, especially when you have children, you've got all the less reason to think that way, then it will you won't have the willpower, you won't have the will to try to make it work. The reason why dating fails, for the most part, why people have to date numerous people before they eventually get tired and say, okay, fine, this one kind of seems to work, where they kind of explore. One of the reasons, if you look at it, 60 years ago, for instance, right, there wasn't much dating, but there were a lot of marriages. The majority of people that came together and stayed together were married, but there were a lot less divorces compared to the amount in relationship to the amount of people that were married. Whereas if you see today, very few people actually end up getting married, because it's all about dating in the beginning, right? And then even those who do get married finally, there's actually a lot more divorce happening today than 60 years ago. So it's like divorce has increased, marriage has decreased, 
right? Now, one of the reasons for that is when you're not yet married and you're trying each other out, you're, as uh, some would say, you're shacking up together, right? What happens then is that after the first few, uh, after the first few meetings where you act all formally and you're all you know, in your best behavior because you, know, you have to show off your best, your best uh, behavior and conduct, but after that you, get, you become informal, you start joking and you start taking things easy. That's when our defects begin to show. Now tell me which human being doesn't have defects? Right? Which human being doesn't have defects? But that's when your defects begin to show. So then because you're not committed, it's just a date at the end of the day, you're just trying it out. Right? It's just the, uh, uh, you, you're not committed to each other. So psychologically, there's no willpower there to make it work. Well, I'll find somebody else. Okay, forget it, it's all done. We've seen so many, that's why I'm not a big fan of long engagements. Because what engagements do is that they kind of give a kind of pseudo validity to talking to each other and interacting. And then if it's a year long engagement and two years, and I feel sorry for those guys in that situation, right? What happens in that time is that you've, you know, you've basically gone through to the other person, you know that person, and then you find out what the, uh, what the defects are. And you say like, forget it. By the time the marriage comes along, forget it. What happens when you're married, and as long as you've done it in the proper way, following the sunnah, you've done your research, you've found out about the other person, all the main important points, and you've got the main things done, and you get married, then obviously there's a greater reason to commit and to try psychologically to try to make it work. So you will try to resolve the differences. You'll try to overcome the rocky moments that happen. And they come and they happen. These are, these are basically like two plates uh, of the uh, two continental plates coming together and there's an earthquake once in a while, right? But at the end of the day, you have to have the commitment and subconsciously do not ever, do not ever be contemplating divorce if there's no absolute reason to. Try to do separation, try to do everything else, and at the end, if it doesn't work, then there is divorce. But it's the worst of the lawful things that need to happen. About the scoring points that I mentioned, that's a constant thing to, to constantly try to do for the other person, because marriage is not about each person trying to uh, demand the, right of the other, uh, rights of the other person. The idea is to try to do good for the other person, and that's how this unity will work, and that's where divorce won't come into the picture. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ so beautifully, again, he says, and I'll finish with this, he said that if there's something that you will dislike about your spouse, you know, there's a khuluk, there's a, an attitude that he or she has, you know, there's something that they do once in a while that just cheeses you off. Right? That just really turns you off, that really puts you down. Just focus at that moment, just focus on all the other good things. Human being, weakness, defects, just focus on all the other good things. Remember the good times. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that if he dislikes some khuluq, radiya biha ukhra, he will, he, will, um, he, he will like others. And that's how it needs to carry on for those who've had, who are, who've had or who may have issues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Grant all of those here who are married a good, successful, prosperous marriage based on taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who are not married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them pious spouse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them pious spouse and give us all pious progeny that are safeguarded. All of us are safeguarded from fitan, from fitna, from trials, tribulations and the mischiefs of this dunya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an eternal life in Jannatul Firdaus in the hereafter. Now in closing, I'd like to mention that obviously this uh, program incorporates the book launch of uh, Mufti Muhammad ibn Adam's uh, kitab, his book, the new book. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to read it yet, but I'm sure that the idea of the book is how to, you know, uh, get a better understanding of the things that are permitted between the spouse, between the husband and wife. And it's essential guidance, I believe, especially in today's age, where so many various different ways of interaction between the genders is, uh, is, is uh, um, seen and uh, observed and heard about and spoken about. It's extremely important to get that guidance, to know our limits as to what's permitted and what's not permitted. And then, Inshallah, that should give us a more informed understanding of this relationship and hopefully it can help us to, to increase an understanding and the, the harmony and love between the couple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants success to that book and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants us all tawfiq wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.
Mm-hmm.